Hi, this is Bill Papoon, Managing Partner with Construction Science and Primavera Scheduling. I teach about 100 classes a year on Primavera software. These classes run anywhere from one day to three days. In our longer classes, we have the opportunity to talk about CPM methodology. What exactly is the longest path? And what is float? And how are these things calculated? Because many people who use scheduling software don't have a precise knowledge of where float comes from, I thought I'd put together this video and give you a basic understanding of float. So the first thing we're going to look at is a primavera schedule. And most of us are used to looking at the Gantt chart. It's time scaled. We can usually tell critical activities because they're a different color. In this case, they're red versus green. And we see the float values that have already been calculated. But you might find it interesting to look at this network in a different fashion. There's actually something called the activity network in Primavera. And it looks like this. And in today's lesson, that's actually what we're going to use because it's easier to follow. Without the time scale, everything is spread out much better. The relationship lines are easier to see. In a large network, and I'm, when I'm looking at the Gantt chart, I usually can't tell the relationship type without clicking on it or looking at additional information in the bottom window because they're too close together. When the durations are short, the relationships start to stack up quite a bit on screen. But here, a one-day duration, for example, activity A is actually just one day, is given the same treatment as an activity such as this one up here which has a 20-day duration. So when you're trying to troubleshoot or at least understand the logic, this is a lot easier to read. So we're going to take advantage of this to do both the forward pass and the backwards pass. And I've got a couple of slides here that will let us see that right off the bat. So we're going to start with the forward pass. And what I did is I customized the activity network boxes to show a little bit more information. In the upper left-hand corner, we have the activity ID. I kept it really simple. You'll notice in the middle, I also kept the description very simple because we want to focus on numbers. And the first number we'll look at is in the upper right-hand corner. That's the duration of each activity. Down below on the bottom line, on the left-hand side, will be the start day. And on the right-hand side will be the finish day for each task. So we can see that activity A starts on day zero, finishes on day one. You'll notice I also put a forward slash in there. That's because as we do the backwards pass calculation, we'll be plugging in another number for comparison. So let's talk about the forward pass first. We start at the beginning, day zero. And so at the end of this activity, it would be day one, which would also start off the activities that follow it, in this case, B and C. And I know a lot of you would say, wait a minute, activities B and C don't start on day one, they start on day two. It'd be the next day. Well, you'll notice for the float calculations, it's better to ignore that because that's a calendar issue. And not all calendars would necessarily show that. For example, what if we start work at 8 o'clock in the evening and we finish at 4 o'clock in the morning on the following day? That's an eight-hour shift, but we can see that the predecessor would finish at 4 a.m. and the successor would follow at 8 p.m. on the same day. So we really are not jumping to the next morning. So in this example, we're just going to pay attention to the count of the days. So the first thing we do with the forward pass is we just add up the numbers. Now, these are all finish-to-start relationships. Primavera will draw a finish-start relationship, as you see here. If it was start-to-start, -start, you would see it coming out of one box on the front end and going into the front end of another box. Finish-to-finish, -finish likewise, would go from the end of one box to the end of another. It's easier here because all we have to do is add numbers. So we start off at day zero. We're at day one at the end of that activity. The next activity, 
starts on day one. It's an eight-day duration, so it finishes on day nine. And we can see that activity E starts on day nine. It's an 18-day duration. It finishes on day 27. And so we continue that. We simply keep adding the duration to the starting day, and we get the ending day for that task. When we get to activity L, we can see that the start point is day 47. We've added the 16 days. It's day 63. That would become the start day of activity M, seven-day duration, so it finishes on day 70. That's one path. That doesn't tell us all the possible answers. We'd have to follow every other possible path. Back in 1980, when I was wrapping up my college education, we did all of this manually because we uh, did not actually have access to anything other than a mainframe computer, and it was our job to calculate the float and calculate the overall length of the project to compare it to the results coming out of the mainframe. So the next possible path would be from A to C down to D and moving across the middle of the screen. Once again, we're starting off at day zero. We're ending at day one. Up here on activity C, it ends on day nine, which kicks off activity D on day nine. It's a 10-day duration, so it finishes on day 19. And we continue on, and we see that when we get to activity H, it finishes on day 48. Well, 48 is a smaller number than 63, so right off the bat, we would know this couldn't be the longest path of construction. It's already been eliminated. So that would be a good candidate for float, but we're not going to look at float just yet. We have one more path to consider. Again, activity A goes to activity B in this case. So B starts off on day one, and it has a 20-day duration, so it finishes on day 21. Activity F starts on day 21. It has a 12-day duration, so it finishes on day 33. We continue on to activity K, which starts on day 44. It has a 14-day duration, so it finishes on day 58. But again, 58 is a smaller number than what we see the first time we did this exercise going across the top. So day 63 governs, which means the length of the project is 70 days. Now we need to do the backwards pass. And you'll see that I filled in the other numbers already. So we start at the end, as you might have guessed, and we work our way backwards. We're not adding durations, we're subtracting durations. So the last day of the project, we know the biggest number we got was 70. So I plug in 70 to the right of the forward slash, and we start subtracting the durations. 70 minus 7 makes it day 63. That's the same answer I got going forward. When you get the same answer in both directions, that's your longest path, because you're subtracting one number from the other. So you're going to subtract the backwards pass number from the forward pass number, actually I should say that's the other way around, we're going to subtract the forward pass number from the backwards pass number, and we'll get our float. So in this particular case, obviously zero. We move over to activity L. We know that 63 is the answer we got back here on the backwards pass, so I plug in 63 at the end. We subtract 16 days, that's day 47, which is exactly the answer I got going forward. And you'll see that's true for everything else in red. And as you might imagine, Primavera is showing red boxes to indicate that, that this is the calculated critical path. So the answer is the same in both directions, and we get zero float. Let's take the middle path. We know that activity M finishes on day 63, the same answer forward or backwards. So that means activity H can finish on day 63. So I plug in 63 right here. When we subtract 48 from 63, that's 15 days. We have 15 days of float. I take 63, I subtract the 10-day duration. That gives me the starting point, essentially the late start date. That's another way of thinking about this, that this is early start to the left, late start to the right, early finish, 48 late finish, 63. So we can see that the late start is day 53. 
which is 15 days later than the early start date that we obtained on the forward pass. And likewise, we move over to activity G. We know that the late finish is day 53. I subtract 19 days. That gives me a late start of day 34. As we work backwards, eventually this path will merge back into the critical path. So on the critical path, we already know it's zero float. So the plus 15 would stop right here on activity D. That will be the last one we see with plus 15. Working across the bottom, we know that the late start for activity M is day 63, which makes it the late finish for activity K. But the early finish for activity K when we did the forward pass was day 58. The difference between those two numbers, five days, five days of float. We work backwards to activity J. J can finish on day 49 because that's what we calculated as the late start for K. The early finish was day 44. Again, the difference is five. And because these are all finish to start relationships, naturally they would all share the same float value. This one, this path, also merges back with the critical path, which is activity A. So naturally, activity A is still zero float, whereas activity B will be the first time in the sequence that we see the plus five. Now, calendars can certainly make an issue, because when you look at the float value of an activity in Primavera, the float value is expressed according to the calendar on that activity. So let's say you have five days of float. On a five-day duration, meaning a five-day calendar, it would show up as five. If you have a seven-day calendar on an activity and it has one week of float, it would be expressed as seven days. But in both cases, we're saying this is an activity that has one week of float. There's actually no difference between them. They could be on the same path, but their float values don't actually match. And that's something that Primavera can usually decipher with the filter called longest path. Because see, Primavera does not really get locked into the idea that all activities on the critical path have to have exactly the same float value. There are certainly circumstances because of multiple calendars where activities are clearly on the same path, the same longest path, and don't share precisely the same float value. Well, I hope you enjoyed this explanation of the longest path and float. If you have any questions, feel free to visit our website. You'll see that we have a blog. And there's also quite a bit of information regarding our weekly online and in-person training sessions. Thank you.